here tonight. I'm glad you made the decision to be here. There's lots of places you could rather have been today, uh, but I'm glad you made the decision to, to be here. And I'll say I'm glad to be here back home in my own bed, um, although there's a part of me that still wishes I was still on Honduras, um, but it was good to be back. I feel rested and ready to go. Um, it's weird being out of your routine for a week to leave and and experience a completely different culture. You have a little culture shock, and just about the time that you get used to it, it's time to come back home, and you have to almost go through another culture shock. I had a lesson prepared before we left about uh, evidences for the resurrection of Jesus, and uh, it was almost complete, but it, I just wasn't feeling it tonight. And I'm not the kind of guy who can, I can't preach on just about anything. It has to be on my heart. And there's a lesson tonight that's been on my heart. Uh, the teens have heard a shortened version of it, but I wanted to expound upon some of these uh, thoughts and principles about, uh, about the beautiful feet of those who deliver the gospel. I want to thank everybody who contributed in any way to the mission trip. I know many of you, probably all of you, were praying. Many of you gave up uh, some of your family members for a week, uh, your husbands, your children, and uh, allowed them to be, to be gone for a week uh, to, to, to have a new experience. I want to thank our elders for greenlighting that trip and allowing it to be a possibility. And I don't know what's going to happen next year, but I know that we're already talking about some possibilities. What we can do to, to get out there and fulfill the Great Commission. But the reality is we don't have to wait till next spring break to fulfill the Great Commission. We can do it here in Paris, Tennessee. And that's something that this trip has taught me is that what I did down there, I need to do here every day. I want to talk about feet tonight. This may gross some of you out at the beginning. I don't know. I know Caitlin Killian, she hates feet. And when I did this devotional for the teens, uh, we were doing object lessons every month. And so I actually had us all take off our shoes and look at our feet. Because feet are nasty. Uh, feet are gross. You get, well, I could do so many things right now that would just gross you out. Um, you get stuff on your feet that's nasty. They're always in contact with the ground. Um, they get dirty. They get fungus and stuff on them. And, it's nasty, isn't it? Did you know there's about 250,000 sweat glands in your feet alone? And they'll produce up to, they can, half a pint of moisture in a single day. There's some squirming going on out there. That's nasty. Feet are gross. But God says that for those who deliver the gospel, their feet are beautiful. And that's what I want to talk about tonight, how we can have beautiful feet. Not in our sight, but in, in God's sight. It's not because of how big they are or how small they are. It's not because of how recently you showered or had your feet washed. It's because of the message that your feet help you deliver. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Uh, I want to just briefly talk about Romans chapter 10. And uh, I grabbed my New American Standard running out of the house, and so that's what I'm reading out of up here uh, for this moment. In Romans 10, Paul it, He's talking about salvation. And in verse 14, he says, How then will they call on him in whom they've not believed? How will they believe in him whom they've not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they're sent? Just as it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, in verse 16, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. And Paul is quoting in that passage uh, from different parts of Isaiah, mainly Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 7. And uh, in that, letter, that letter quote was from Isaiah chapter 53. And Paul uses Isaiah as the background for his message. And as you go over to Isaiah chapter 52, we read uh, what Brian Foster read for us this evening about how our beautiful feet uh, bring that good news. The, the picture in Isaiah is of, uh, is of a messenger bringing good news, hopefully, uh, that a town or a, that a king is waiting on. Maybe there's a battle that's happened, and they're waiting for the report. They're waiting for the messenger. Uh, did we win the battle? 
Or did we lose the battle? Are, are we free or are we now their slaves? What's, what's going to happen? Is the messenger going to bring good news or is he going to bring bad news? And you see in verse uh, 8, the watchmen, are they're watching. They're watching for this messenger. And uh, Paul uses this imagery as, an, as, a, as his basis for talking about the gospel message, uh, the salvation that comes from this good news. And so tonight I want to talk about, uh, I really just want to use Isaiah 50, chapter 52, verse 7 as our outline to talk about our beautiful feet. And, uh, and here we go. Here we go. Our feet, they bring good news, is what ver- the first part of verse 7 says. We like good news, don't we? We, we like to hear good news. Um, I got the raise. I got the job. Uh, I got into the college I wanted. I, I passed the test that I needed to pass. Uh, someone's getting married. Someone's having a baby. Someone's celebrating an, an yet another anniversary. Someone's become a Christian. This is good news. And it's the kind of news, even greater than that, that we can bring to the world. They fill us, this good news fills us with joy and happiness. Proverbs 25, 25 says, As cold water to a weary soul, so is good news from a far country. That fits very well in with our, the picture going on in Isaiah chapter 52. The word gospel, as we know, it means good news. When we talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's the good news of Jesus Christ. When Jesus came and, came and, and, and dwelt among us, sometimes if we're not careful, we'll, uh, we'll start thinking that Jesus invented some new words like baptism. Uh, Jesus didn't invent those words. They were already in, in usage of the day. But he took the words like that and gave them a new meaning. Now you're, you're baptized in my name. Uh, baptize simply means to immerse. You could immerse anything in water. You could baptize anything, but now uh, Jesus gave it a new meaning. Gospel is, is one of those words that, that came to have quite a, a little bit different meaning when, when used to talk about Jesus and his message. Because it was used in that sense of, of someone spreading good news of a king or, or good news, the gospel of, of a battle or of a victory. And Jesus says, uh, Jesus has his gospel. Uh, the example in 1 Samuel 31, 9, the Philistines have, have finally killed Saul and his sons. And it says there that, that they took the good news back to the, to the Philistines. It was good news to the Philistines that Saul was now dead. Uh, the, the angel who met the, the shepherds and told them about Jesus' birth in Luke chapter 2, verse 10, it says the angel brought good news. It was good news. A Savior is born. God is dwelling now among us. So why is the gospel good news? And this could be a lesson in and of itself, but here's a few reasons. The gospel is good news because now we know there's victory. There's victory over sin and death. Death, where is thy sting? Death is swallowed up in victory. 1 Corinthians 15, 55-57. It's good news because now there is a Savior. We're not lost anymore. We don't have to remain lost anymore. There is a Redeemer. There's someone that can buy us back. And bring us back into the fold. There is now forgiveness. We have forgiveness of sins. We don't have to carry them around anymore. They can be uh, not just pushed aside, but totally wiped clean. That's good news. We now have purpose in our life. We're not floundering around trying and reaching for everything that we can. We now know what we were created for and why, uh, and why we were created. We're no longer now slaves to sin. Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. But we're slaves of righteousness. We're now slaves of God. We can be made right with God now. And we can have a relationship with Him for now and for eternity. There's no longer this separation that is talked about in Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 through 2. Now, we're brought near because of Jesus, because of the gospel. And so, we as Christians need to be bringing this good news. Beautiful feet. Are we bringing this good news to others as often as we can? See, when you go back to Isaiah chapter 52 and you think about that image of the messenger, there was some urgency there. I mean, you've got to get there quick if you're delivering that message because you've got something they need to know. And it's the same for Christians. There needs to be an urgency about our mission, an urgency about the message that we bring. And, um, you know, it, the idea about feet being beautiful and nasty, how much more so back then when they didn't take showers like we do? They didn't wear closed-toed shoes. They're walking on dusty roads. And yet, Isaiah is saying to them, you have beautiful feet if you're bringing that message. We also, 
we proclaim or we announce peace. Again, the scene is of, of one waiting on a messenger. What kind of message is he going to bring? Are, are we now slaves? Are we now uh, going to be persecuted? Or, or is, it one of, is it a message of security, of safety and peace? Have we won or have we been defeated? So many people in this world, and I know we talk about this a lot, but they don't have peace in their lives. They may think they do. They, they have something that, that helps them cope and get through life, but it's not true peace. It's not true Christian joy. Satan is a good liar. And Satan has deceived the world. And he's deceived some Christians into thinking that if you do, uh, if you, if you do what pleases you and makes you happy, you've got peace. And many people believe that. And maybe for them it's true if they're believing that lie so much. And yet, uh, God says that's not the case. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 15 says... Uh, it talks about the gospel of peace. It's there is the passage about the gospel armor, having shod your feet <clears throat> with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Why is the gospel one of peace? We have a God who loves us and cares for us. We're free from sin. We know what's expected of us. You know, I get uneasy sometimes when I don't know what expectations are for me. If someone's given me a task or given me a job, I'd like to know, here's the things we expect. You could call it a job description. That brings me peace because now I know what I need to do to please my superiors. We, we know what's expected of us as disciples. God has revealed that to us. It's not a mystery anymore. Now, the gospel is one of peace because ultimately we know which side is going to gain victory. We know the outcome. Uh, how this is going to end one day on Judgment Day, uh, it's not going to be a surprise. We know that God is going to be triumphant. I find it interesting. Um, the words uh, God of peace, God is described as a God of peace, I think I said uh, at least five times in the New Testament. One of those is in Romans chapter 16, verse 20. And there it talks about God, uh, the God of peace will crush Satan. It doesn't sound like a very peaceful um, imagery, there it sounds more like a warfare imagery, and yet he's described as a God of peace, because we know what the, vic what the outcome will be. It will be victory over the deceiver, over the liar, over Satan. The question is, how do we achieve this peace ourselves? Romans chapter 5 verse 1 gives us the answer. It says there that having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other way to get it. You can search and try to find that maybe, maybe temporary peace that the world offers. And you might have it for a short season. And yet true, lasting peace, the kind of peace which surpasses understanding, Philippians 4, 7, is only found in Christ Jesus. Christians should be the most peaceful people around. But don't keep that peace to yourself. Use your beautiful feet and carry that message. Carry that peace Carry that good news to others, whether it be a co-worker, a next-door neighbor, or even an, your own family member. Next, Isaiah says that we bring good news of happiness. Uh, I noticed that the uh, translations differed on that, and I kind of did a little bit of research, and the word, the Hebrew word, has a wide range of meaning, and that's reflected in the translation differences, but the point is the same regardless. Our message is one of goodness, of joyful, or of happiness. We can carry that joy, we can carry that happiness, or we can carry the, that good tidings of good things to others. You know, there's different kinds of happiness and joy. There's shallow happiness, uh, and then there is a deep, lasting joy and happiness. And for the purposes of this point, I'm going to use happiness and joy interchangeably. I, I once knew a girl who, um, she would always greet you with a smile and ask you how you were doing as she walked by you. Uh, at Freed Harmon, but I didn't really know this girl. Uh, she wasn't really a friend of mine. She just did that to everybody, and maybe she was sincere, but it almost seemed a little bit fake because she wanted, uh, it was never a real conversation. It seemed like it was more for show, and she always had a smile on, and yet you, all, you wonder, um, is this for real? Is this genuine joy? The joy that we want is the kind of joy where James says, consider it all joy when you encounter trials. And trials are not joyful. But the kind of joy we want looks to the end. Because James says uh, that that trial uh, will produce patience, will produce perseverance uh, when, it, when it's through. 
Uh, it's the kind talked about in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, of our Lord Jesus. It says that uh, Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He, he, he knew that what he was going to go through was not joyful, and yet he knew the end was joyful. And that's what we as Christians need to cultivate in our lives. A true joy that doesn't just disappear when things don't go our way. Uh, but it's there no matter what happens in our lives. We should be a joyful people. We should be a happy people. We should be the most joyful people to be around. If you find yourself maybe being a negative person or constantly maybe uh, speaking evil of others and, and you're lacking this joy in your life, I can't tell you exactly what the answer may be, but maybe there's something in your life that needs to be changed. Maybe there is some sin in your life that needs to be uh, repented of. Or maybe you just need an attitude change. I don't know what it is. But whatever it is, if you find yourself with that attitude, you've lost your joy. David did that one time. He had that problem. In Psalm 51, uh, David uh, there is uh, lamenting uh, his sin. Uh, it's a psalm we know well. Um, and in verse 12, after uh, many believe that it was written after David's sin with Bathsheba. It's a touching psalm, Psalm 51. And in verse 12, David says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. David, a man called uh, a man after God's own heart, uh, had lost his joy. He lost his joy in his salvation in God, and he needed it to be restored and to be renewed. But we can bring this good news to others. We can bring this joy. First of all, we need to have it ourselves, and then when we do, we need to share it and deliver it and, and, and take it across however far we need to take it to others and to spread that good news. We also announce salvation. We proclaim salvation. And isn't this what, what spreading the gospel is all about? It's about saving souls, about being fishers of men, about producing fruit in our lives. And uh, I'll tell you what, I had a, a, a gut check in Honduras, uh, and it made me realize um, a lot of things, but it made me realize uh, how much I was not planting seeds, how much I was not uh, trying, at least trying to produce fruit in my own life. You know, we're so accustomed here to, to going door knocking, and, and we mostly roll our eyes, don't we? Church is doing a door knocking. Uh, who's going to show up? And it's usually pretty few. And uh, it's because, for, quite honestly, it gets discouraging. Doors get slammed into your faces. I heard that the last time we did it that somebody actually had somebody take the flyer and put it in the trash can right in front of their face. That's discouraging, isn't it? But we can't let that deter us. Uh, in Honduras, the, when people, uh, I went to the first house and was just kind of ready to give a flyer and move on. And the translator looked at me and said, no, she said she wanted to study the Bible. And I said, whoa, okay, hold on just a second. I had a little mini freak out in my mind. But then we went in, and they, uh, they opened up their doors. Didn't matter what condition their home was in. Some of them would be cooking. And they're sitting there talking to you while they're cooking. They don't care. And you just start, you start talking about the gospel. And it's amazing. Some knew a little bit of the Bible. But you ask some, what do you know about Jesus? And they say, I don't know anything about Jesus. What do you know about the Bible? I don't know anything about the Bible. It blows your mind. There's people here that are the same way. You don't have to go to Honduras or Panama or Europe. It doesn't matter where. You don't have to go to those places to find uh, fields that are, that are ready to be sown. You can find it here in Paris, Tennessee. But Jesus, I'm, I'm sorry, but God has a plan of salvation um, from the beginning. It involves sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And it was that action where God demonstrated His love for us. All God wants people to do is to come to Him in faith and belief, to turn away from our sins, to leave the old man of sin behind and put Christ on in baptism and live for God. That's our response to God. Uh, but He is the one who saves. And it's, a, it's free. It's free to anybody. It doesn't matter what language you speak or where you are, or how old or how young you are. It um, doesn't matter. It's free to all, and God wants all to come to Him. He wants all to be saved. And we can bring that salvation to others. Isaiah 12, 2 says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord is my strength and song. He also has become my salvation. I read a little bit of Victor's article today, and he talked about the tension between 
what God is doing in his sovereign power and will, but yet how he still relies on man. And that has puzzled me for the longest time, and it probably always will. You know, and we think, wouldn't it be easier if God just wrote it in the sky? Wouldn't people believe? But for some reason, God has chosen you and I to be his instruments. Uh, the literal body, the hands and fingers, and the feet to deliver this message to others. And again, I don't know why God did it, but I know that he's got some wisdom behind it. And so I'm not going to question it. I'm going to be that instrument of his. And so I hope that you are proclaiming salvation and bringing uh, along the mountains, along the roads, and the countrysides this good news to others. And the last thing mentioned in Isaiah 52, 7 is that we, we tell people that your God reigns, that God reigns. There is a God. We sing this song. He is alive and he reigns. And he didn't reign then, he's reigning now. And he's, he reigned then, he's, he's reigning in the future. He's always reigned and he always will. And isn't it nice to know that somebody's in control? Uh, we're not here on our own. God didn't just... Uh, throw us on earth and expect us to just figure it out. Uh, things didn't happen by chance. The universe is not random. There is a God who reigns. And he has shown us uh, love. He's shown us the way to live. This is a message of hope. This is a message to me of relief. We're not here alone. We have a God who cares for us each individually. Um, our cares are not so, are not so small that, that, he doesn't, that he doesn't hear. Oh, he's not some unloving dictator. Um, I mean, imagine being able to just pick up your phone and, and call the president of the U.S. and him to, to listen to, to whatever concerns you might have had. And, and not just listen, but actually perhaps act on the concerns you had. Uh, that's unheard of. That doesn't happen. Uh, I don't know how many, of, how many would actually want to call the president, but it just doesn't happen. We can do that with God. We can pray to him anytime, anywhere. An unbroken connection for faithful believers. And God, He cares. He listens and He acts on, on, what, we, on what, we, what we need. He's a king who personally cares about each and every person in His kingdom. Psalm 103 says, The Lord has established His throne in heaven. His kingdom rules over all. Psalm 47, 8 says that God reigns over the nations. God sits on His holy throne. There's a lot of people out there that don't know that God is reigning. They don't know there, there's a battle being waged over uh, their soul. And we can pronounce that to them. We can deliver this message to them that there is a God who cares about them and who's reigning. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the, the song Troy led earlier. By pure coincidence, uh, I love to tell the story. And I thought I had it marked, but um, I love the lyrics uh, to this song. And what I want to ask tonight of myself and everyone else is, do we love to tell the story? I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story. I know it's true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. Can we sing those words truthfully for ourselves? And, and the other verse that has always struck me um, is the last verse. I love to tell the story, for those who know it best seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. Do we hunger and, and thirst for righteousness? Do we hunger and thirst for the good news, just like we did the first time that we ever heard it? Uh, that's what we need to be cultivating in our lives. And we need to be delivering that message, not just keeping it to ourselves, but delivering it to everyone we can to plant as many seeds as possible. Um, there, were some, there were six baptisms this week, but there were so many more studies that were conducted. Some of us, I think I did two days of evangelism, and then the rest I was helping with other things, but we had some that every single day, uh, before lunch and after lunch, were out in homes evangelizing. Some went back to the same homes over and over. And we actually had one who actually evangelized on the plane from Houston to Nashville, and we're planning on hooking up with them on Facebook to give them more information about the Church of Christ. You're planting seeds. And you don't know who else is going to water that seed down the, down the road. And ultimately, we have to trust that God is going to give that growth. But we're not asked to save the world. We're asked to tell them about the one who saved the world. And we're asked to just plant the seed. 
regardless of how ugly you think your feet may be or how ugly they actually are, God says you have beautiful feet if you're delivering the good news. Well, what makes them beautiful are the message, is the message that it brings to others as you tell the world about Jesus, about its Savior. Tonight, who do you need to take the gospel to? There's somebody that you know that only you can give the gospel to. And I pray that you will do that and start, uh, start making the changes necessary. And I always, I'm talking to myself more than anyone else. You could do that in Honduras like we did last week, um, or you could do it here in Paris, Tennessee, wherever you are uh, as the body of Christ. Tonight, maybe there's someone who needs to repent of sins and make a change in their life. Or maybe tonight we have somebody who wants to put Christ on in baptism and obey the gospel message. And I don't know where you are spiritually, but I do know that we can help you and that ultimately that God can help you. Whatever you may need, we invite you to come as we stand and sing. <laughs> Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb?